Hello, friends, new and old. It's Allison here, and I am super excited about my guest today. I saw her on Bro Brother Augustine's channel, who I interviewed yesterday, and I knew immediately that I needed to have her on my show, especially because one of the things I'm trying to do with this channel is to grow the Orthodox community for women because we have so many amazing ortho bros out there giving us great content and interviews and live streams. And so I really want to provide a community and a, a safe place for women to leave comments and get to know one another and um, just want to grow this community. So um, please subscribe to my channel if that sounds good to you. And I hope you will like this interview. I mean, click like that is, and I hope you enjoy it. And um, without further, further delay, my guest today is Rachel Wilson, also known as Based Homeschool Mom. Welcome, Rachel. Hi, nice to be with you today. Yeah, so when I saw you on Brother Augustine's channel, I immediately liked you and I knew we were going to be friends. So thank you for being here. Thank you again. And I know you have a book coming out that you've just finished writing. So I really want to talk about that today. And um, first, do you want to just introduce yourself a little bit? And of course, the very first thing I need to ask you is, because a lot of our viewers may not know this term based <laughs> and how it applies to the Orthodox community. So can you explain how you got this name and what it means? Sure. Well, it was kind of given to me in a live stream chat where I was talking back and forth with people. And it was about like motherhood and homeschooling that I was going back and forth with people. And somebody was like, oh my gosh, it's a based homeschool mom. And I was like, I'm going to steal that. So when I would talk online, I would use that as a handle sometimes if I didn't want to use my real name. Um, and based kind of just means you're willing to say what you think is true without fear of like social repercussions. Um, there's a lot of online communities that will take that word and use it to mean different things. It's become like a bit of a, a meme, I guess you would say, but to me, that's what it means. It just means um, I'm willing to say a lot of things that I don't think everybody would be willing to say and um, just be honest about what it is that I believe in. Mm -hmm. Well, I think as Christians, we're called to do that. So congratulations for for being brave and I know it's not easy especially you know with social media and YouTube watchers leaving comments that might not be very nice and so yeah. you just probably <laughs> especially when we start talking about what your book is about um, yeah. I think this will apply because it, it does ruffle some feathers and sometimes the truth is really hard to hear yeah and especially, you know, so many of us have been conditioned our whole lives to think a certain way, accept something as truth when maybe it's actually an inversion of the truth. Yes. And so um, first I want to ask you about your faith. So you're a Christian and you've been a Christian your whole life, I believe, but you've recently converted or you're converting to orthodoxy. Do you want to tell us a little bit about that? Yeah. So I, in the orthosphere, I guess we'd call it, most people have a really cool and exciting story about how they came from like, you know, a much more difficult past and went through a lot of bad things in other faiths or other belief systems first and kind of had like a rock bottom moment that brought them to orthodoxy. My story is not quite that cool. Um, mm -hmm. I was raised in a pretty conservative Protestant area and my family was, you know, in church most of my life. Um, my grandmother, who is kind of like my mother, is a, a very good church going Christian lady, but it's more like a Dutch Protestant thing, like a Calvinist background that I have. And I went 40 years of my life thinking that I was a pretty good Christian and that I kind of knew what I was doing, you know, as a Christian and that I could talk about theology, at least a little, it wasn't like a specialty or anything. And last year I was introduced to a couple of people who were Orthodox Christians. And I thought, 
why don't I know what that is? How have I been Christian my entire life? Never had like a big falling out with my faith or anything like that. And I, I know about Protestants and I know about Catholics, but I've only vaguely ever heard of orthodoxy and I've never looked into it. And I thought that seems a bit neglectful on my part (laughs) as a Christian to not even know what that is. So of course I started reading about it. And like most people who do, I kind of, you know, I'm sitting there, I'm reading some church history and I'm going, oh shoot. Hmm. Oh boy. I don't know. Maybe, maybe I need to look into this more. And then I start, you know, watching stuff online and listening to some great apologists like Jay Dyer. And I was sitting here with my headphones in doing my nails, listening to Jay Dyer one night back in, I think last December. And my husband was across the room from me. And every few minutes he'd hear me going, darn it. I think I even used the S word. I was like, shit, you know, (laughs) it's like, what's going on over there? And I'm like, I just realized my whole life is a lie. That's all, you know, just just had my whole life turned upside down. Um, wow. Just because that's I, well, like, powerful. I think that's a pretty exciting story. Well, to think that you're a Christian and that you know what that means. And then to find out that you don't know anything about the first thousand years of your yeah. own faith. I mean, I felt a little bit angry. I felt a little bit like I had been tricked almost or like deceived. You know what I mean? I thought, nobody thought it was important to talk about this. All I ever heard about was, you know, uh, the Catholics and then Martin Luther came. Yay. You know, the reformation, that's all I heard my whole life. And a lot of those preconceived notions were wrong. So, you know, that the way that I am with everything, if I get interested in something, I'll, I'll get really (laughs) nerdy and nerd out on it and dig in really deep and try to really figure out what's going on before I try to formulate an opinion. So, yeah. Once you do that with orthodoxy, I feel like you're pretty, most people are going to be in. I feel like if this was something that was taught in school or taught to everybody when they're young, the Orthodox church would probably be the biggest church in the world. Yeah. I feel like it's a little bit hidden almost on purpose by people who may not want you to know about it. Mm -hmm. I kind of get a feeling like that. Well, another thing about our church is that we're not huge evangelists. We are called to evangelize, but we're called to do it in a way where our lives are inspiring to others. We don't get up on the soapbox and take the Bible and, you know, and, um, yeah. And I've, I've talked about how that was kind of a big part of it for me, because the, one of the ways I started looking into it was because I had been praying and telling my husband, I'm struggling with like evangelism. I'm struggling with it. And I think the reason is because I, I'm very logical and, um, I have like a debate background and it was hard for me to justify, even though I would hear like the best Calvinists or reformers, you know, give me their whole spiel. I would, I wasn't even like completely convinced or I felt like maybe there's just something I don't understand and, and I'm not understanding it well enough, but you know, that's one of the reasons I looked into it. I was having a hard time evangelizing from a Protestant perspective because it didn't all truly make sense to me either, to mm-hmm. be honest. Mm-hmm. That's kind of what started me looking. Just quickly, I want to mention Jay Dyer as well, because Church of the Eternal Logos and Jay Dyer's channel, those two channels, um, I guess they just popped up in my YouTube to watch next. And I was like, Oh, who are these guys? And so I, I credit both of them to introducing me to orthodoxy. I'll be grateful to both of them for the rest of my life. Yeah, me too. (laughs) Me too. It's great that we have people that, and I don't, I mean, I'm a catechumen myself, so it's not like I'm going to go out and start trying to do apologetics. Cause I think that's like you said, the Protestants get on the soapbox And a lot of times that does more harm than good. A lot of times that ends up leading a lot of people away Mm -hmm. from the church or leading them to think that it's false because people who don't really know their own theology are out there, you know, beating everyone over the head with it. And like I said, that's one of the things that I was struggling with. I was like, you know, but just telling people the way that I'm told Calvinism works or salvation works through that doesn't even really makes sense to me and to people who don't 
have like a background in it already, it sounds silly to them. You Mm -hmm. know what I mean? It's very hard to get somebody hooked in that way. And so I felt like there's something I'm missing here. There's something I'm not doing well enough and I've got to figure this out. And of course, then you go down the rabbit hole of church history and find out that you really don't know what you're talking about. So yeah, yeah. Brother Augustine said, those who have the most objections to orthodoxy or the most misconceptions are the ones who know nothing about it. You know, they've never done any research. They don't know anything. (laughs) Yeah. He's, I I've heard him say a couple of times that it's not something you can figure out from the outside. And I think that that's true. Yeah. Um, and another thing that was great for our family about it is my husband, another guy who has always called himself Christian has always read his Bible and knew the Bible really well. I could never get him to go to church with me to Protestant churches. He Mm. just always felt like there was something kind of phony or kind of Mm -hmm. empty. And he just, he was like, honey, I just, I can't do it. He's like the minute I'm in there and they start with the rock band and the singing or whatever. (laughs) And I even went to a more conservative church where we didn't, we still had like a piano and it was more conservative, but even then he was just like, I'm in here for 10 minutes. And all I want to do is like, I'm waiting to get out of here. You yeah. know, I couldn't get him to go. We went to our first divine liturgy and he was like, yes, yes, yes. To all of this. Yes. This is what worship looks like. Yes. You know, to him, oh my gosh. To him, yeah. It was instantaneous. And he was, I didn't even have to talk him into it, which I was really happy about. I don't think I've ever been so happy about anything for a long time that I was just like, you love it. And he's like, I love it. We're going. And he just committed oh. like right then and there. So that was that. a huge, huge blessing, huge answer to prayer for me. So, yeah. Yeah. I just, um, I wasn't interested in attending any, when I started reading the Bible and I mean, I, you don't really know my story. I don't think, um, I was in the new age for about 30 years until oh. about a year ago when I started reading the Bible and I wasn't, thinking I was going to go to any church. Church just did not attract me. Nothing about it. I didn't even watch things online, you know, the, how they have like televised services and things. And my cousin sent me a couple of links. I just didn't even have any desire at all. And then when I, same thing as your husband, as soon as I found out about orthodoxy and I went to divine liturgy for the first time, I was like, I belong here and this is worship. This is so beautiful. And it's so complex. And, um, I love the whole idea of it being, um, it's, it's not, um, transactional. It's God is, um, it's God's service to us for us and we're participating in it. Yeah. We're not doing these things to, you know, like, Oh, I hope God answers my prayer for my new car, the new job I want. Like it has nothing to do with that. It's just gratitude and people get emotional and just not emotional, like crazy. Yeah. Not like charismatic. Yeah. Right. Just like, Oh, really? emotional yeah yeah, like like this life is so beautiful we're so blessed and uh, yeah it's so deep I know I'm sure it's different for everybody but and I don't want to keep talking about myself I want to go back to you um do you know (laughs) do you know many orthodox women I'm I'm just now starting to meet some so I I really don't I don't which I I'm so glad that you're doing this and starting this channel and making a place for women. Cause like you said, we got a lot of great ortho bros out there <laughs> we, and they're doing great things. They're writing books, they're doing apologetics. And we kind of do need a little bit more of a space to connect more with women. And something I've heard a lot of the guys say is that usually it's the guy who will find orthodoxy first yeah. and then have to kind of drag his wife or girlfriend along yeah. um so I guess I'm a little backwards in that respect but um no I don't I don't know a whole lot of orthodox women but I don't even I mean I know a lot of Christian women I guess I would say mm-hmm. but not and even you- ones that are very devout as far as that goes couple of Catholics I would say see and like you said earlier Christian Christians are not exposed to the ancient church. So once they do get exposed, they convert, you know, a lot of them convert. And so again, that's just what I want to do with this channel is to just invite 
people, you know, not, um, like I was saying earlier, like I'm not bashing anyone. I'm certainly right. not an apologist. I just want to have guests on the show that can share how orthodoxy has transformed their life and just what they love about it. And yeah. so, yeah, so we'll, we'll have to come up with a name. I mean, they have ortho bros, so yeah. we're going to be like the ortho sisters, I guess. I don't yeah. know. Something we'll have to come up with a catchy name. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Ortho Bro just has like a cool sound to yeah, it because it kind of rhymes. But um, okay, and I really want to start talking about your book. Let me just see. Um, yeah, let's let's just get into your book. First of all, congratulations. Hey. I I've wanted to write so many books. I have a novel that I'm halfway through, and then. Yeah, I have all these ideas, but they just never seem to get completed. So I want to know everything. Um, just start telling us about the book and why we should read it. Sure. Um, well, I started doing a lot of um, like online debates, um, formal ones, informal ones, live debates, like live stream debates with feminists. And I would get all this feedback from people saying, I've never heard anyone argue it the way that you argue it or I've never I didn't know this or this that you that you said or historically I didn't know this happened or that that's why things happened and I kept kind of getting urging from people especially my husband just kind of saying like you need to write this down or like do a blog or you got to do something about it and I have four daughters so I wanted to leave something for them because I'm thinking I'm hoping I have a whole big old mess of grandkids, you know, I'm hoping for like a good 15 to 20 grandkids, <laughs> Lord willing, you know what I mean? Oh yeah. So I wanted something to leave them because, um, uh, the way that I grew up, my mother was, um, definitely a feminist. She calls herself a Marxist feminist. So she, she and my dad dated and I was kind of an oops baby. And they kind of begrudgingly married each other. Um, my mom had a Catholic background, but she wasn't really a practicing Catholic. My dad came from a Protestant background and his family was more serious about it. So um, they, we ended up going to like a reformed church where my dad was a deacon. My mom um, had gone to college where she got a little bit radicalized. I think she volunteered for Planned Parenthood there um, for a while. And so being a suburban housewife, all of a sudden, when it wasn't in her plan for herself, she would read tons of feminist literature. I remember Stacks. She's a very, very smart woman. I mean, she's highly intellectually intelligent. She would be reading all the time and have giant stacks of books everywhere. But she really bought into like the 70s, 80s feminist movement and everything about it. And I think she really came to resent being a stay-at-home mom. She didn't want to do that. Um, she felt like her talents were wasted. Um, she wasn't happy with my dad. She wasn't happy with the church. And so she had an affair with someone from our church who was much younger than she was. It was a huge scandal because we were in a small town and my parents ended up divorced. My dad felt the church didn't treat him fairly because it wasn't his fault that there was a divorce. Um, so they both kind of fell away from the church and I continued to go with friends. So here I was going to church every weekend and neither of my parents were anymore. And um, it was a bad divorce. It was a bitter divorce. And the person my mother ended up marrying that she had this affair with is somebody who was a, um, like a criminal, a sex criminal, basically. Mm. He had been convicted of sex crimes with kids we got taken away and placed with our dad. So I had this chaos around me all the time growing up. And I had my mom kind of yelling this feminism stuff at me. And then my dad, of course, saying it was nonsense and garbage, but he was so demoralized that he didn't really fight back a whole lot. So I think that without me knowing, and because I grew up in the eighties and nineties, which was a very go girl era. I mm -hmm. mean, we had the go girl stuff pushed down our throats Oh yeah, on media, TV, movies, magazines, everything. You didn't say, if someone asked you, what do you want to be when you grow up? You can't, you don't say a mom. No, no. And I was always in gifted programs in school and things like that. So everybody had this expectation that of course I was going to go to college and either be a doctor or, 
yeah. um, something like that. And by the time I got through with high school, I didn't want to do more school. Um, and I had a boyfriend at the time and I ended up pregnant and had my first baby when I was 20. And I had a big moment when I first had to bring her to daycare and go back to work mm -hmm. because I wasn't married, but you know, my mom and, and everyone around me told me you don't need to be, it's not important. Mm -hmm. You know, you guys are living together. You're in a monogamous relationship, same thing, not a big deal. Um, and you know, I, he didn't make enough money or care if I stayed home. Um, he wasn't even thrilled to be having a child with me and didn't really want to get married, but here I was. And I remember thinking on the way there, I am taking my baby to another woman where I'm going to give her half of what I make to do what I would rather be doing and what I feel like I should be doing, which is raising my own child so I can go do something I don't care about for eight hours every day mm -hmm. and plus the commute time. So by the time I get home with her and, you know, do the laundry and make dinner and things like that, I've got maybe an hour to spend with my daughter. And I just remember thinking, what a stupid system and who came up with this and why is this? I just specifically remember having this moment of being like, how is this better? How is this so much better for us? How is this empowering? But you know, I was 20 years old and I felt like, well, maybe I just don't know what I don't know yet. And I just kept trucking and things did not get better. They only got worse. I had a second baby with that guy and halfway through that pregnancy, he took off. He was like, oh I'm not interested. I don't want to have a family. I'm not ready. It's too much for me. And, and he left. And I remember just feeling so completely betrayed by all the, everything around me, society and my own mom and, and neighbors and friends who all told me, this is fine. You can live with your boyfriend and it's all going to work out the same. And marriage is kind of a dying institution. It's not that important. Yeah. And I couldn't reconcile that with my faith, but here I'm surrounded by other Christian women who are doing the same exact thing as me living with their boyfriend and, and, you know, having babies out of wedlock and everybody saying marriage is just a piece of paper. Well, by that time I started to think, I think it's more than a piece of paper. I think it's really important. This clearly didn't work out for me. Um, I never wanted to be in a position like I was in with split up parents because any child who has divorced parents will tell you it's not fun. Even if there's an amicable, amicable divorce, it's still not fun trying to feel torn all the time and going back and forth and having step parents and step siblings and things like that. And I knew that there was nothing I could do at that point for my two oldest daughters. Like they're going to have a split family now and I, I have no control over it. So again, I felt like I thought feminism was supposed to give me more control over my life. I thought it was supposed to make things better and easier for me. And I just felt like at that point, it wasn't making sense to me. So I started, you know, doing some historical study and reading some literature and things and thinking, I don't think I believe this. I don't think that I buy this feminism stuff, really. I don't, I don't know that this is wholesale better. Um, and then a few years later, I meet my husband now. Um, and he was, <laughs> he's everything that feminists hate. <laughs> he's a, a very strong, confident man. He is, um, is better to me than anyone in the world. I mean, he's my best friend, my greatest supporter. He takes great care of me. But he also isn't the kind of person who's going to put up with like lots of overly emotional nonsense, mm -hmm. which is something I needed that I didn't know I needed. Yeah. So growing up in all that chaos, I had a lot of bad habits that I didn't even know I had because compared to the crazy people around me, I thought I was pretty stable. And my husband, it was like second or third date, I think he said something that annoyed me. And I like threw something at him and got a bratty attitude and he didn't get mean or anything. He was just like, um, if this is how you deal with things, then I don't think I want to date you. So I'm going to leave now. And you just think about that and call me if, you know, if you can calm down. That's great. And at, yeah. And at first that. I was super mad. My first instinct was just to be horrified and angry and upset because I mean, when you're young, especially if you're attractive, when you're young, you're kind of used to men taking whatever crap you throw at them. Yeah dealing with your tantrums and just kind of putting up with your nonsense yeah, to be perfectly we're, we're honest. Princesses. 
princesses right. can get away with anything so yeah you know it's one of the one of the things that you'll see um on social media and men out there if you ever see this on a woman's profile timeline anything run the other direction it's uh if you can't handle me at my worst you don't deserve me at my best oh god right so it's like this idea that <laughs> I'm a woman. And if I throw a temper tantrum or fly off the handle, I'm, and if I'm frustrated or upset, I'm not responsible for my behavior. And well, you just have to take it and you're not allowed to you lose your temper, but I am, you know? So after he left, I remember being really miffed and then thinking, you know, the logical part of my brain starts taking over and going, wait a minute. Number one, I don't want to be that girl. I don't want to be the girl who throws things and gets it crummy attitude if something doesn't go her way and it was the first time that it had ever been pointed out to me that I was doing that and then the second thing I thought was why do I do that you know why do I think it's okay to act that way because if he had done that to me I wouldn't have thought it was okay imagine um if on our third date he had gotten mad and thrown something at me yeah you know, everybody would say, oh, he's an abuser and you need to leave. But somehow if I do it, it's okay. So oh I really gosh. thought it through and I was like, oh my gosh. So I called him and I was like, I'm really sorry that I did that. And that you're right. That's crappy behavior. And, and I'm not going to do that anymore. Now I had female friends at the time who thought that was wrong. Like they, they thought I was being brainwashed by some kind of misogynist who was making me into a submissive kitten. And I always tell people, I, I think I'm the strangest person to be saying the things I'm saying, because for a woman, I, I have a very like aggressive kind of masculine side with certain things. I, I was a competitive power lifter for a while. Uh, I shoot guns. I'm a firearms instructor. Um, I'm pretty smart. I'm pretty not shy. I'm very forward. I'm very, you know, I'm a strong woman, I guess you would say, you know, like I'm the kind of stereotypical strong, independent woman, but, but those aren't the toxic traits of right. a strong woman. Right. And yeah. I remember having my other aha moment in the shower when a few years later, the same guy and I were, were having trouble and I was in the shower thinking to myself, okay, could this really just be that all the men are impossible to live with? Or is there still something I'm doing or something in me that is like contributing to having relationship problems? Wow. And I remember thinking to myself, oh, if I want a guy who's like going to be responsible, protect me, um, that I can count on to pay bills, to go to work all the time, like all those things that we want men to do, right? Be reliable, be responsible, be strong. Um, be like steady and even tempered and all those things that you would want in a man. Well, is that kind of guy going to want to be with somebody who wants to step on him all the time and fight with him all the time and try to struggle for dominance all the time? Yeah. Or if I want to be that kind of a woman, what kind of guy am I going to attract? I'm going to attract ones like the first guy I was with who are not responsible and do avoid conflict and do avoid responsibility and we'll let you walk all over them, but you can't count on them. They're not going to provide for you. They're not going to protect you. They're not going to do those traditional masculine things that all of us women find attractive. So I remember thinking, oh, I have to pick one, <laughs> you know, like if I want this type of a man, which I do, and I knew at that point I did, then there are ways that I can talk to him if I don't like something that's going on that are not going to be me basically being sassy and aggressive and trying to dominate him or trying to like usurp his will and force my will all the time. Um, and a lot of people, especially um, even Christian women, sometimes if you use words like submissive, right? Instantly, everybody gets triggered. If yes, you say yes. submit to your husband or be submissive mm -hmm. or something like that. Um, and I kind of understand that, you know, um, given the way that I am, I understand why that word rubs women the wrong way. But what it means is, look, if you're a strong woman, you want a man that's probably even stronger than you. Yeah. Now, if you don't, if you want a man that's weaker than you, you should ask yourself why, because it's 
probably not something healthy. There's probably something codependent or something weird going on there that's making you want a man who will let you basically walk all over mm -hmm. him or, or dominate him all the time. Now, if that's your thing and you want to do that, I can't make, I can't force you to do something else, but I just would say submit doesn't mean what people think it means. And I think orthodoxy is something, orthodox Christianity is so good at framing things in a way that is true and real. And the way that God made men, men and women, it doesn't mean that women are lesser or lower than mm -hmm. men. It means that God gave men the ability to handle the really tough stuff. Yeah. So what I'll say to women sometimes if, you know, some of the controversial stuff I say that I get in trouble for, um, people have said, oh, Rachel, you should run for office. And I'm like, nope, I won't run for office. I don't want to be in Congress. I don't want to be in the Senate. I would not join the military. I wouldn't be in one of those positions. And the reason why is the same reason that a lot of people don't know. Most women did not want the vote prior to the 19th, 19th amendment, because they said, why would we take on a responsibility that we are not even able to handle? So for example, if we were to be invaded by Russia, you know, like during the cold war, when everybody was afraid Russia was going to come and do a red dawn, is it going to be the women that are going to pick up all the guns and go out and fight and defend the nation? Are we going to be the ones who, um, you know, defend the borders? Are we going to be the ones who rush into the burning buildings to save people? Are we the ones that if there's like a terrible natural disaster, need to crawl into some rubble and find survivors? No, we're not the ones that do that. It's men that do that. Yeah. And thank God for that. Thank God that they do that right, and that right. he designed them to do it and for them to handle it. We have really important responsibilities, really wonderful things that are assigned to us that we are made to do. So why are we only interested now because of feminism in taking on the things that God did not equip us for and rejecting all of the things that God did equip us to do? Because it does take a strong woman to be a good wife and mother, just not in the same way that it is for the husband to do. You know what I mean? Oh, yeah. So the title of your book is so intriguing to me. Yeah. My next question is, how did we get here? How did this happen? Yeah. So I started the book thinking I was going to just lay out the case against feminism and for traditional families. The things that I had been arguing in debates for a long time, like the welfare state taking over the place of the, the father, you can look at statistics and it shows that in almost every way, things have gotten worse, the more that feminism has become institutionalized. So way less fathers in the home, decreases in marriage rates, increases in divorce rates, um, abortion rates going through the roof, uh, substance abuse for especially women, but for everyone, and especially for children who are from divorced families. You know, so I thought I was going to throw out all these stats and make my case. And I thought I need to just research funding, like where did funding come from for feminism? And in doing that research, I happened to stumble upon the fact that most of the feminist icons going back to the 1800s had occult roots, most of them. I'm not even just saying a couple of them, most of them had ties to some type of occultism. And I thought, okay, that seems important. And I've never heard of it before. And I, again, I thought I knew my stuff about this. So I went back and researched like the 1800s leading up to women's suffrage and I didn't know that Elizabeth Cady Stanton, who is a feminist hero, a suffragist hero, best friend of Susan B. Anthony, that she and 26 other feminists got together and rewrote the first five books of the Bible and had it published and called it the Women's Bible. Mm -hmm. So I read it. And what they did is they took out all the patriarchal stuff that they didn't like. They took out, you know, God the Father. They took out you know, the Eve being the primary person who was deceived in the garden, they took out most, most of what makes Christianity Christian. And they said the reason they did it was because we have to get rid of this patriarchy. We have to take the patriarchy out of Christianity. And I thought, well, first of all, you can't do that. Second of all, I thought, 
if women were so oppressed, right, if they were so oppressed, because what you always hear is like, oh, they weren't allowed to, they weren't allowed to read or write or, or have jobs, and they couldn't do anything, they were just chained to a stove in the kitchen, I thought, well, that's weird, because these women were allowed to do this, they had a best selling book that's still in print today that you can still buy, that was published by a publisher and marketed all over the country and was a bestseller in the late 1800s that took patriarchy out of the Bible. So I thought, I don't think they were as oppressed in all circumstances as we were led to believe. So that was one thing I thought. And then the other thing was, okay, where did they get this idea? So I started researching like the spiritualist movement that started in the mid 1800s and how I did not know that that had infected so many areas of Protestantism. I mean, there were tons of churches being founded between 1840 and 1900 that were not really Christian churches like Christian science, um, Quakers, Shakers, um, Unitarians. And if you look into any of those theologies, they're not even Christian theologies. No. A lot of them don't even regard Christ as divine. They uh, think that the Bible is a really useful, helpful tool, but not necessarily divine either, uh, that Jesus wasn't anything but a good teacher, that there's lots of different paths to heaven, that you can contact spirits and you can be, these women, <laughs> these women were spirit mediums. In fact, there's a, a really interesting woman who teaches at the new school in New York. She's a third generation witch, I think. And she teaches about feminist history and witchcraft at this, you know, art school in New York. And I follow her work because she's actually really good at what she does. And she herself says, there's probably not a suffragette who did not spend some time at the seance table. Mm -hmm. So most of these women, aside from making public speeches and, and trying to get suffrage passed, a lot of them toured the country here, went to England and toured England and Europe working as spirit mediums and tarot card readers. Um, Victoria Woodhull, who was one of the, she was technically the first woman to run for president. And she ran with um, a, very, a couple of prominent like black liberation theologists. She was a spirit medium. She was a psychic and she worked for a very high up powerful people on the New York Stock Exchange, made them tons of money. <clears throat> and they all attributed it to her fortune telling abilities. Oh, so, and these stories were throughout everything I found in first wave. And then we get to second wave. And those women were also usually involved in <clears throat> new age or occult stuff. Um, and then the CIA also got involved yeah. uh, around the time of second wave. So the book turned out to be something totally different than I thought it was going to be. But I thought, people have got to know this because I think if women knew this, a lot of us wouldn't just accept the feminist narrative hook, line, and sinker. We might question it a little bit more. We might not be so eager to, you know, accept things like female pastors, which are becoming ubiquitous in, in Protestantism. Um, if people knew that this stuff came from way back in history from goddess worship, from um, spirit mediumship, from occult practitioners, we would probably have a different opinion because the way that it's taught to us is more just like women looked around one day and they said, hey, life's not fair and we want to vote. And so they bravely marched and they, and they made things better for women. And I think that's super misleading. I think there's huge parts of the history that haven't been told. And it's really interesting and kind of crazy stuff too. So I think it's actually really entertaining, at least for me it was. So I thought, I think other people will, will like these stories too. I'm just so impressed because you're homeschooling four daughters. Yeah. You're a mom, you're making dinner, you're, <laughs> you're a wife, like now you're an author too. And well, the book I, took me to just over two years. Wow. So it was something that I had to do when I had time. And the oldest two are now graduated. They're 18 and 20. So now I just have two, which is still a lot of work, but it seems like a lot less <laughs> compared to what we had before. Right. So um, I've been starting to find little chunks of time and finally got this finished. Um, it was weird because it would get to the point where I was almost happy if I caught like a really bad cold 
<laughs> like a flu. Cause I was like, I can lay in bed and work on this. You know, I can do research <laughs> and I can work on the book. So I, I kind of want to draw this conversation back to orthodoxy along huh. with what you've said, because sure. the word that kept coming up for me was boundaries and on church of the eternal logos, Patrick talks a lot about the feminization of our culture. Mm -hmm. And then there's a lot of content creators and authors talking about um, the church, like innovations. Okay. Mm -hmm. So we had our ancient faith yep. and there was nothing, you know, the saying, if it's not broken, don't fix it. Then yeah. all of a sudden the heresies got to be greater and greater and then we had the split with the roman catholic church and then all of the you know what are we up to like ten thousand different denominations now so there's yeah. all these innovations right it sounds like such a wonderful thing oh innovations that's great yeah sure. but really what it's done is there were boundaries and as as history went on these boundaries got annihilated and i've heard that you know the enemy doesn't really care about satanists and new agers because there's nothing there's no challenge there like there's no right. there's no 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 reason to yeah. like do anything with them it's the christians that the enemy is trying to take out of our faith and so a, a lot of churches are infiltrated with what we could call satanic, um, you know, deceptive, so more Luciferian, but yeah. um, can you talk a little bit more about how important boundaries are and how the Orthodox Church will never, I mean, if you listen to Father Hears, who yeah. I love, he is just such a patriarchal icon, or, you know, like, um, I don't want to use that word, but just someone that I look up to so much because He's, he's like, no, there's no, this, we have our church. This is how things are. And the problem that we face today in Christianity, like I said, is this dissolution of the boundaries that the early church set up for us with, right from the start. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, that's true. And I think that's why um, I've picked feminism as my big battle is because it's something I can talk about as a woman that men can't because the minute they open their mouth about it, it's you're a misogynist. And, and it's not that I don't get attacked and called those names too, but he, uh, David Patrick Harry is completely correct about that, about these boundaries being dissolved. So if you, if you look at a statue of the Baphomet, it's got both male and female parts. Um, and the thing that feminism did was, and it, again, it sprang out of these early Protestant churches that were kind of like even branched off further from like Lutheranism or, or something like that. The Protestant Reformation itself was an enlightenment revolutionary thing. And what people, especially in America, don't understand is like this cycle of constant revolution that in itself is, is pretty demonic. Um, it, tends to give people this revolutionary spirit where we're never done, right? So like with the social justice warrior stuff, you're never done. We're never equal enough. There's always another dimension. There has to be more. So like when, when they talk about the gender wage gap, you know, uh, you ask them like, okay, when will we know if men and women are equal? They can't even tell you because the whole point of revolutionary thinking is for it to be perpetuated forever. You, you can never be done with it. So that's how you end up where we are, where it's almost a complete inversion. So now we have um, women that reject everything about womanhood that makes us great. Um, motherhood, being a wife, the, the impact we used to have on communities. Like this is what I tell women when they're like, well, you're going to regret someday that you didn't ever do anything with your life. You're going to regret that, you know, you were this smart person and you didn't get a degree and go get a job. And, and, you know, you're going to get to 40, 50, 60, and you're going to, you're going to regret it. And I say to them, do you think there, that if I had gone to university and gotten a corporate job somewhere, or even become a doctor, that I would have the same impact that I'm having right now, raising the next generation of mothers and wives? 
Do you realize that by having four daughters, if they all get married, and let's just say they each have three kids, I've got 12 grandkids, each of those 12 grandkids has three kids. Within a few generations, I've impacted hundreds of people directly and how their families are formed, what their faith is going to be, how they view the world. I mean, being a mother is like a huge, huge impact to have. Being a good wife is a huge impact to have because the men that do great things in this world need women to, to support them in doing that. But it's that, it's that satanic revolutionary spirit that says that's not good enough. That's not good enough. You have to be the main focus. You have to be the star of the show all the time. You have to be the center of everything. It's like a very egotistical um, mindset to have. Yeah. When Christianity is supposed to be about serving, you know, Christ was about serving and he would always give glory back to God, even though he's the second person of the Godhead. So for us to say that we're Christian women, but be saying, no, we have to be pastors. We need to be bishops. We need to be teaching and we need to be preaching. Um, and to say, we need, you know, we need lesbians in the church now, and we need big rainbow flags hanging on the front of every church. And, and the things that have come about, it's because we have failed to maintain the apostolic tradition of the church that Jesus built. It's because we let these outside revolutionary enlightenment forces, Lucifer comes as an angel of light. Mm -hmm. um, he, he always presents himself as giving us this new knowledge, this like illuminated knowledge, right? So it always sounds really good. It sounds like progress. It sounds like, mm -hmm. oh, we're going to create a better world for everyone. But if you look around right now in the year 2021, it's hard to see anywhere in people's daily lives that things are really so much better. I mean, you could say engineering or technology, you know, like if I, if I get a gunshot wound, they can treat it better. But as far as how it affects our faith, our relationships, our, how society is structured, it hasn't been nothing but rainbows. It hasn't been all good. And in fact, I always say, you can't think of a single part of your life not one thing in modern society that has not been impacted by feminism. And we've only had about 120 years of it. Mm -hmm. 100 years since suffrage, one century, which if you compare that to 6,000 years of known history, it's a tiny drop in the bucket. And yet we have taken the societal order that was there for 6,000 years, six millenniums, and we have turned it upside down in just a couple of generations, everything from how companies are run to, I mean, every girl that's 18 can have an OnlyFans now. Oh, My no. two daughters who are 18 and 20 have girls they graduated from high school with who went straight from high school to starting an OnlyFans. And I'm still looking at that and wanting to know what we were liberated from. Yeah. Um, there was a power dynamic that existed before feminism, which is that as the women, we choose the partners. Women get to have who they choose, whereas men get to have whoever will pick them, <laughs> you know? So we're the choosers. People have twice as many genetic ancestors in women as they do men, because women have been more successful at reproducing. We have enormous sway over history, even though, you know, there may not have been a ton of emperors or things who were female, there were some queens but we had tremendous amounts of sway. Who, who got to marry, who got to have children? It's a huge chunk of power that's not talked about. And so by giving women equal um, legal power, equal power to run companies, to own things, um, and then giving them excess of power in the court system. So men's uh, sentencing is usually at least twice as long as a woman, a woman if you're convicted of a crime. Men lose out in family courts almost all the time. Um, women aren't even convicted as much of a crime as men are, even if there's equal evidence. So the power dynamic has actually been shifted in favor of the feminine. And that's one thing that I love about David Patrick Harry's work is he's so good at showing how those boundaries have been dissolved and how those things are being inverted. Yeah. It's not creating more equality and it's not creating something better. 
it's an inversion of the natural order that God created for us, which was better for women. And of course, when people hear me say that at first, they kind of freak out because they're like, but how, how is it better? You'd be trapped in an abusive marriage and not allowed to read if it was 200 years ago. So again, that's not actually true. And uh, I lay out a lot of that in the book about the misconceptions about how, um, how <laughs> oppressed women really were versus what the actual situation was. Well, they, you know, the women of today, oppression to them is, you know, like they can't go out and have sex with as many men as they yeah. want, you know? Basically, if a man says no, that's oppression. That's what I always say. Modern day oppression of women is if a guy tells you no for any reason on anything. And you're right. It's like, if I can't, they want complete and total uh, autonomy to destroy themselves is what it has turned into. So um, another thing I I'm doing with my channel, <laughs> I have all these ideas of what I want to do with this channel, but I really want to promote the fact that the Bible is a manual for how to live a safe life. It's protection. It's yeah. not rules. It's not like you're evil and you're terrible if you don't yeah. follow this. And, um, it's such, um, I mean, I was brainwashed, you know, I used to think Christians were brainwashed. Well, not being Christian, being secular and new agey, I was brainwashed to believe that the Bible was just this horrible, like, you know, like the opposite, yeah. whatever it really yeah. is. And so I want to know from you, um, how do we keep educating and informing people that by living a Christian life with morals and boundaries, it's, it's a beautiful thing. I mean, it's protecting yeah. us. It's not tell it, this is what, um, you know, cause I still have friends. I still love my friends who are not Christian. I love them dearly. And I hope that they can see that, you know what I'm saying? That, that this yeah. is about protection of our soul. Yeah. It's serious. Like this is it really is. serious. <laughs> You're right. You're hundred percent right. And, um, I think that's another thing that's lost in Protestantism that I found again in orthodoxy is that discipline and submission to God is freedom because it allows you the protection to live that, that joyful and rejoicing life. So you're going to be a slave either to your vices and your sins or to the almighty creator of mm -hmm. everything, yeah. um, who is good and who loves you and who created you in his own image and wants wonderful things for you. But that's not how people see it anymore. And if, if we can kind of show them that maybe that like, hey, um, doing drugs and partying and sleeping around and um, using your body to get attention and things like that, that's not freedom. Mm -hmm. That's not liberation. No. You think that when you're young because of the power. Uh, young, attractive women have so much power that it, if, if it is not guarded in some way, it will destroy them. And I see it all the time. I've seen it happen to women a lot. And one of the things I always say is think about the second half of your life because we don't anymore. We see um, celebrities who've been nipped and tucked and Botoxed and God knows what else they are doing to stay looking like they're 25 when they're 55 or 60 and trying to be a sex kitten forever. And I think young girls grow up seeing that and there's like all the camera tricks and the makeup and everything else. And they think that this sexual power they have at 20 is still going to be there when they're 60. Mm -hmm. And a tragic thing that happens is women will hit 35, 40, 45 years old, otherwise known as the wall. Um, and it doesn't have anything to do with you not being pretty anymore. People misunderstand that. It's just that you could be the hottest 45 year old ever. But if you're next to a hot 25 year old, the men are going to go for her yeah. because she's still young and she's fertile and, and all those things. And so if you, if we could let young women know, Hey, that's not permanent. It's a very temporary part of your life. It's a power that you have that has to be, um, tempered in a responsible way. That's good for you 
rather than in a way that's going to end up literally destroying you. And I think that's a story I've heard from a lot of women who came out of, you know, that kind of lifestyle to Christianity is like, I was a stripper. I was, you know, I was a party girl. I was sleeping around. Um, I never wanted to settle down because there was a different guy to take me on a trip every week or take me out to dinner all the time. And, and so I was just living the life. And then suddenly one day, all of that power kind of started to fade and they're really hurt by it and shocked by it. And they don't understand what's happening. And suddenly they're like, oh my gosh, I might have another 60 years of my life what am I going to do now? So I think that orthodoxy is so good at, at helping women have the proper context for what God created them for so that horrible things like that don't happen to them. It's like, um, feminism almost just offers you up like a, a demonic sacrifice, really. I mean, women who get hooked into that end up having multiple abortions sometimes, or, um, you know, getting into really self-destructive things. And when they could have been um, living a life that's pleasing to God and therefore having this wonderful, peaceful, um, really meaningful life with a future that matters, that when they are 70, they're going to be happy. They're going to be fulfilled. They won't be invisible. They won't be forgotten. They'll be surrounded by a loving church community, by their own loving family, I mean, that's the kind of thing that we should be showing women and talking to them about rather than um, just get more Botox and more lip fillers and bigger boobs and, um, you know, pimp yourself on the internet for likes and clicks Mm -hmm. and think that that'll last forever. So many good points, Rachel. I totally agree. And you hear all the time women say things like, but there's no good men left you know, um, yeah, actually there are, (laughs) because I I do want to say, you know, um, to the audience, Rachel and I are very blessed. We have men that support us and not every woman has that, but there are so many good men. You just, you know, worry about you live a life that will be attractive to, like you were saying earlier, be the woman that a good man wants. And, you know, maybe you're not a virgin anymore. Okay. Don't, you know, you can't go back in time. Now what, like, where are you starting now? Are you reading your Bible? Are you praying? Are you going to church? Hopefully to divine liturgy. I mean, there's so many single men in the Orthodox churches. It's all I hear all the time is like, in in fact, in my church, they're all the catechumens are men and, um, just all there's just so many men in the Orthodox church because it's a patriarchal religion. And I would just invite the women listening who have any interest in orthodoxy, you know, and you're looking for a good man they, they exist. I promise. And they're, they're online and they're in the online community too. Yeah. So. Yeah. Like when I was at the trad forum in June, it was like, it was like a <laughs> shooting fish in a barrel, the young single men. And we're talking like, you know, guys who are fit, they're healthy. Yeah. They have resources. They're godly men. Yeah. They, have morals, moral yeah, they have morals. So they're strong and they're, um, totally worthy of like leading a family, but it's all, um, again, for men having the proper context for what a good man is. Men have a lot of physical power. They are bigger, they are stronger. Um, that can either be used in a bad way where they become like these abusive guys, or they end up running with gangs or, or doing pickup artist stuff. Or if you take that power and put it in the context of God's, uh, design for men, you end up like, you know, a, one of these good men running a household. Like my husband always says to people, he's like, how much of a tyrant do you really think I can be um, in a house with all these women and everything else that he's got four daughters and, and they all love him to death. And he, Sweet. you know, it's really, it's made him into a better man too. And he tells young men this all the time. His big message to them all the time is um, get out there and find good women. He says, don't look for them in bars. Don't look for them at the club, you know, um, start going to church, you know, go to, go to places where good women are, find one, 
um, have a godly marriage with her and you're going to have a family and it's going to bring you joy that you didn't know existed. I want to read a quote because I saw this on Instagram today and I thought of you in this conversation <laughs> that we were going to have. And now I think I feel like right now is the perfect time. It's a quote by John Chrysostom from around 400 AD. Have no concern for money. Love your wife more than you love your own life. Never be at odds, but be true. Prefer her company at home above being out. Esteem and admire her publicly and advise her patiently. Pray together, go to church and discuss the readings and prayers. If your marriage is like this, your, per your perfection will rival the holiest of monks. And I just love that so much because we don't have to go to the monastery to live a holy life. We can yeah. have a beautiful marriage, putting God at the center and prayer. And, the, and I love that. Go to church, read the Bible and discuss it together. And yeah. our culture, again, our culture just does not tell us that this is what happiness is. I mean, what I just read, if you're a woman and you have this in your life, what, how much better <laughs> I, I was traveling, making a ton of money, shopping and buying expensive things and having a fancy car and all the things that our culture tells us makes us happy. I mean, how does that even compare with what I just read? <laughs> it doesn't. And that's something that um, people will you know, I run into that online where people are like, mm, your life sounds boring. No, thanks. And I'm like, first of all, I haven't had time to be bored in 20 years, so you'll never be bored. Um, and second of all, we have a ton of fun. Like we really do. Um, and it's not like, um, we are perfect and have never sinned and have never done anything oh, wrong. I mean, no. both my husband and I had to work on ourselves and helped each other we helped each other work on ourselves a lot. Um, and so, but the work was so worth it because now on a day-to-day -day basis, like when this lockdown happened, my husband was online talking to people and he was like, I think the lockdowns are, are bad and I don't like it, you know? Um, but I can't say that I mind being stuck at home with my wife and kids all day. It's fun. Like we, we were playing board games. We would like get into, uh, you know, like we watch different movie trilogies, like watch, watch one each night and like take turns, uh, baking stuff. And we're always goofing around and laughing and joking with each other. And the kids weren't lonely because they had each other. And, um, so it just, I mean, I think a lot of people when that happened had to really take a hard look at life and, for us, it was like this grit for me personally, it was like a big, for the first time really as an adult, I felt like, yeah, I really did a good job. I made the right choices. I've got the life that I wish I had when I was a kid. I got the life finally that I had been dreaming about since my mother decided to just dissolve my family when I was nine years old. And when I was 22, I didn't think that was possible. I was heartbroken and I thought my life is over. Like I've failed and I don't know how I'm ever going to bounce back from this, but because of faith in God and because of continually praying and continually looking for answers uh, in him, not in the world and not in women's liberation and not, not in the things of modern society, we, we've made that. We've made a home and a life that is like a refuge from everything else in life. You know, if Andy has a bad day at work, he always knows that when he comes home, it's going to get better, you know, and the kids know that the kids know that if anything goes wrong, something terrible happens, they always know that they have a place to come back to where everyone loves them and is going to, are going to help them and everything's going to be okay. And we enjoy spending time together. We love being together. And I think so many people come from uh, really dysfunctional families that they don't think it's possible. I think I've met a lot of people that just, they don't think it exists anymore. Mm -hmm. It's like an elusive dream that they don't think ever existed and doesn't exist. And I'm like, it exists because we've been able to create it. And last year when this was all happening and the churches were closed, 
I was praying all the time to God and saying, teach me the right way to worship you. I want to worship you the best possible way that I can. So please direct me and show me and guide me how to do that. And in a few months, Holy Orthodoxy presents itself to me. So, and I was shocked. And then I keep saying to myself, why are you always shocked that when you pray fervently that God answers your prayer, especially for something like that? So the, the happy, good, peaceful, joyous life that people want is there. And if you haven't gotten it and you don't know where to find it, find an Orthodox Christian church, attend a divine liturgy, and the people there will be more than happy to answer your questions, talk to you, um, tell you anything you want to know about it, anything that seems weird or foreign, because, um, you know, a lot of us are raised, it's a more Protestant or secular society that most of us are raised in. So if you go to divine liturgy and there's anything that seems weird or, or unfamiliar to you, because it is a little bit more Eastern than our Western culture, I think is the main reason. Yeah the people in the church will be happy to tell you about it. At least that's been my experience. I've been to three Orthodox churches now. Um, and everywhere I've gone, people are super happy to talk about it and explain everything. And like you were saying in the liturgy, every little thing, it has meaning. Yeah. It has purpose. It's, it's all intended for something very specific for the purpose of worship and for um, the purpose of your spiritual life. So it's not like when you go to the big mega church in the mall that has the rock band and the coffee bar where it's like, you don't really know why, what you're doing there or what half of it's for. You're not really sure. Like I always kind of felt like that anyway. I always kind of felt like, well, why are we singing this song? I don't, you know, like it, it was difficult for me to tie it together. And I think orthodoxy it's got 2000 years of history where they've been able to maintain this tradition. There's nothing else in the world like that, you know? Mm -hmm. So I, I agree. If you, if you feel like you're missing something and you feel like there's no purpose, you feel lost, find an Orthodox church and attend a divine liturgy and see what you think. I totally agree with you. And I also just want to remind people watching, we know that there's going to be people out there that don't agree with what we've said today. And um, I mean, obviously we, we know that. So we're just asking you to have an open mind and, um, and, and we don't think we're perfect. Like, like Rachel said earlier, the Christian life is about looking at your flaws and working on them, not yeah. thinking that you're perfect. That that's how I, lived when I was in the new age was like, everything was okay. Cause it, it was moral relativism. You know, you can yeah. just, everyone has their own truth and there is no evil there. And you know, that's just like an unresolved part of ourselves that we haven't healed yet. And, um, so like, let's just go drink some more ayahuasca and then we'll be fine. <laughs> like we'll be more holy. We'll be more divine. And, uh, one thing I was going to say earlier, uh, I had this funny joke with myself that if I wrote my memoirs, the title of the book would be, I was a Luciferian and I didn't know yeah. how I wasted 30 years of my life worshiping myself instead of our creator. And, and the whole point of the book would be like, I thought I was healing and finding happiness and being my best self. And, um, it wasn't until I devoted my life to our creator, made him the focus of my life, not myself, <laughs> that um, my whole entire life just got so much better. And yeah, it's not I, easy. It's not, it's not about being happy all the yeah. time. You know, it's going to be right. a struggle. Yeah. So, I mean, the, that's, if you look at, that's another thing that I love about orthodoxy is reading about the saints and that all of them had a struggle. All of us have a struggle, you know, that's kind of, kind of what defines this life here on earth is that struggle. But, um, no, I was certainly far from perfect. Like <laughs> that's why I'm so eager to tell people, um, cause they, they see me now or hear about me now and think, 
oh, well, isn't that nice for you that you found this wonderful guy and you've got all these great kids and that's great for you, but it's not like that for everyone. And I'm like, oh no, this did not fall into my lap. There was no luck involved. There was none of that. I had to, I thought when I was in my early twenties that I knew what I was doing and that I knew what everything was about. And I thought I was a Christian. I really did. And um, it wasn't until I went through a lot of really difficult, really hard, really painful things and had to look at myself and go, okay, it can't always be everyone else. You know, it's, oh, yeah. there's yeah. something I'm doing. There's something about me. There's something about what I'm doing, how I'm thinking, where my values are. There's something going wrong here that has to be me. It can't just be the world. Mm-hmm. Right. And I think that's another thing that bugs me about feminism is it always teaches women that if they're unhappy, it's because, well, they're being oppressed by the patriarchy, or it's because this person, um, you know, isn't treating you right, or, or society doesn't look at you the way that it should, you know, they should be more accepting of body types, they should be more accepting of, of uh, this kind of woman and that kind of woman. And it's like, they're always looking for the world to fix things for you, to make your life better, to make things right for you. The world cannot do that. Mm -hmm. The world can't do that. You have to, um, well, in our, we would say you have to come to God and reconcile yourself with him. And through doing that is where you find joy and peace and things like that. But it's, you're certainly not going to find it in the world and you're certainly not going to find it, um, by demonizing men or thinking that they're all bad um, or anything like that. And men have been just as affected by feminism, you know, in various ways, they've all been, all been affected by it as well. Like I said, I mean, if you look at the way boys in public school are treated, I mean, they're raised not with their mother anymore. You know, they're dropped off in a daycare from the time a lot of them are six weeks old, where it's all women at the daycare. And then they go to preschool where it's usually a woman teaching and then grade school where it's usually a woman teaching junior high and high school. I think only 20% of teachers are men. Um, A lot of them don't have fathers in their lives. Um, Dad's been kicked out of the house or was never in the house to begin with. And so little boys are raised with nothing but female matriarchal influence for the most part. They don't have any idea what it is to be a man. They don't have an, an Orthodox church with a good representation of what God's version of the patriarchy is, where you have men that are held to such a high standard. I mean, that's the thing. In Orthodox Christian churches, men are held to a very high standard. They're expected to be the moral foundation of the family and the moral leadership of the family. It's not like they just get a pass to go drink in with the boys all the time and never be at home. And my husband gets... um, laughed at all the time because he'll tell people I follow the the Pence rule I don't do um, private lunches or private anything with other women I don't do anything with females if my wife isn't there Um, and he doesn't have like um, anytime he's working online and there's women I have access to all that now our marriage is such that it's not like I have to go looking at that but it's just very open that Mm -hmm. way right And I don't worry about, it's just something I don't even worry about. He doesn't go to bars. He's not out at bars drinking. He's not out partying. He's at home if he's not working basically, but that's because it's my husband. Yeah. (laughs) That's where he wants to be. He's just like, why would I, why would I want to, not that he doesn't have guy friends and they do guy things, but 99% of his life is at home, but that's by choice. It's because he'd rather be here. And again, I just, people don't think that's real. They don't think it exists. Mm -hmm. They think that's like a myth, you know? And so we have to accept all these other things that aren't good. You know, we have to accept that, well, uh, you know, women, married women can have guy friends and married guys can have girlfriends and don't be jealous and all this sort of stuff. And it's just that you can't understand it through any other framework, at least to me. I don't think you can understand the proper, um, the proper framework of how men and women are supposed to cooperate and, and live together and be together in a, through a secular mindset or through like a Protestant mindset or something like that. Um, and like you said, I have tons of friends. Most of my friends are not Orthodox. So it's not like I have anything against them either, or that I think they're just wrong or anything like that. But 
it's it just opens up a world where everything makes sense you know it just mm -hmm. creation makes sense when you view it through this orthodox worldview and I, I highly recommend it i don't know what else to say <laughs> Yeah, well, um, before we go, tell everybody about your husband's channel. Oh, yeah. So my husband, Andrew, is he's a blood sport debater. Um, he's done lots of political debates and things like that. But um, since we've been, you know, orthodox catechumen and things like that, it does change you. So even for people who we thought we were Christians before this, and I would say we were, I'm not saying that Protestants aren't Christians, mm -hmm. but um, it changes you like going to liturgy and, and having like a, an active faith that is meaningful, like where everything you do matters. Mm -hmm. Suddenly I'm finding myself like swearing a lot less, um, just talking with a different tone to people. Um, everything about like how I, how I would even take a compliment is different. Like Luke Kendrat is somebody that a lot of you guys might know if you're in the orthosphere. He was one of the first online friends I made in orthodoxy and something that just struck me about him. I think he's a fantastic young man. He's going to seminary now. Mm -hmm. So he's had to stop his show, but anytime I would compliment him and I'd say, you're just doing such wonderful things as a young man in the world he would never take the compliment. He would always give the glory to God yeah. immediately. He would, and brother Augustine does the same thing. Yeah. I've noticed that with a lot of yeah, these men, <laughs> just the glory goes directly to God. So, yeah. um, it's the same thing for us. And so Andrew kind of parted ways with uh, a platform he was on before doing all their debating for them from like a right wing perspective. And he started his own channel called the crucible and it is going to have some blood sport debates. It's going to have some political debate, but it's also going to be um, very focused on like Christian life, family life, um, talking to young men. Like, so the same conversation we're having about how women can get back on track. He talks to young men about that stuff a lot, um, how to you know, get out in the world. A lot of them don't even want to participate in dating or being out in the world right now. They want to just play video games and watch pornography and stay home. And so he's trying to kind of coax guys out of that and help them. And um, a lot of Christian perspective on there. He's already had brother Augustine on to talk about, um, you know, some of the social ills that are going on and how the church can affect those. He's going to have E. Michael Jones on Wednesday to talk about his debate that's going on tomorrow. Uh, I think Jay Dyer is going to be coming on there uh, uh -huh. September 1st. So um, it is going to be some political debate, but it's also going to be some theological stuff. And then also just like um, cultural stuff for like young men, I would say. So a really neat mixture of cool stuff that he's going on. So on YouTube, Trovo, Odyssey, Twitch, it's called The Crucible with Andrew Wilson. And then hopefully the book will be out October, November. I'm self-publishing, so I'm, that's my goal. And it is called um, Occult Feminism, The Secret History of Women's Liberation. And then I'm on Twitter, Telegram, Discord, Instagram. Okay, we're going to put all those links in the comments. And again, thank you so much. This has been so much fun. Yeah, I was super happy to come on and talk because you might have to edit it just because I talk so much. Oh, no, no, I'm not going <laughs> to edit anything. <laughs> and again, for everybody who's still here, we as Orthodox women, we're not saying that the Protestants and the Catholics are bad or like we're over here and they're over here. Nothing like that. The Orthodox church is the ancient church. Yeah. And we believe as Orthodox Christians that we have the fullness of the church that Christ set up with the apostles for all of us. It's for everyone. It's not an exclusive church. And we think we're so much better than everybody else. It's not like that at all. So I just really want to remind everybody that, um, we're not exclusivist type women or anything like that. Right. We love, we love everyone. So yes, exactly. I do. I really love people. And I think the main thing behind what I do is my love for kids. I love children. Mm -hmm. I want them to grow up in safe, peaceful households. 
with both their parents, you know, and if I can just make the tiniest impact on that by getting women to think twice about this feminist paradigm that we are so brainwashed with, yeah. if I can help create more stable families, even for people who are not Christian, any little contribution I can make to that, I, I'll die a happy person because that's what I want for children is to have happy, stable childhoods and intact families. That's so beautiful. And you said earlier, um, before we started recording, you said that you don't identify as an ex-feminist or, um, yeah, anti, anti you don't, you don't identify as anti-feminist. You would finish uh, I call myself a patriarchist. Oh, right. Um, yes, yeah. I and that. I, that word has become so ugly. It's like a swear word, right? The evil patriarchy. And mm -hmm. one of the reasons I use it so much is because I'm trying to put it with its proper context and proper yeah. de definition. Right. So in orthodoxy, we don't have um, like uh, the same structure as the Catholic church. We have patriarchates and we have patriarchs and Christianity is a patriarchal, patriarchal religion. That does not mean it's oppressive to women. That does not mean it's bad for women. It does not see women as second-class citizens or lesser people or anything like that. If anything, I feel like, especially with how we venerate the Theotokos, how we uh, venerate motherhood and, and women's position in communities, if anything, I feel like it elevates women more than secular society does. Um, we're not treated as sex objects or anything right. like that. Exactly. You know, we're, we're honored and venerated as, as important. And um, uh, the idea that, you know, the Theotokos is like, um, she's a type for us as mothers, you know, mm -hmm. and wives and as women, it's um, something to look up to. It's something right. to honor and, that's why I think using the word patriarchy in a proper positive context yeah. is going to be helpful because it's been so demonized. Yeah. Because all those, the, it's the toxic masculine yeah. that you were describing yeah. with all the other stuff, but somehow we got brainwashed to think that patriarchy is the toxic. It's like, it's just yeah. so inverted. It's just it one really of the many is. things that's been inverted. Yeah. Yep. It definitely is. So, so I'm just trying to obnoxiously get out there in the world and put these ideas in the ethos and talk about it as much as I can. And another thing that I'm very passionate about is if you want to, like you were saying, we were talking a little bit before we started recording. If you want to be a mother, there is nothing wrong with that. My 18 year old daughter, people say, what are you, what are you going to do now that you're out of high school? And she's like, well, I want to be a mom. Mm -hmm. And 90% of the time people go, yeah what, but what about this? And, but what about that? Like her own doctor, when she was at the doctor for a checkup was asking her that question. She's like, well, but you know, you could end up with a husband that turns out to be abusive and then you're going to be in real trouble and then you're going to be stuck. And now she has a culinary certificate that she got. So she could, um, you know, work as a baker if she needs to, or something like that. But she's like, no, I'm going to find a good husband. I'm going to get married and stay married. And I want to be a mother and I want to have children and I want to homeschool them. And I like, that's what she wants to do with her life. And I want women to feel like that's okay, because I've been told my whole life that it's not good enough, right. that it's a disappointment, that it's, um, oh, that's all you are. You're just a stay at home mom. Yeah. You know? A woman last night, it's funny, we're talking about this because I was speaking with a woman about, um, we were just getting to know each other and I told her I went to school for interior design, but I, I never did anything with it. And I'm a life coach now. And, um, and then she said, well, I tried going to college. She's an older woman. She said, I tried going to college. I only made it through two semesters. I couldn't, you know, it wasn't for me, I guess. And, and I'm just a mom. And I said, yeah. you're just a mom. Yeah. <laughs> no. I, I, it, I was kind of stunned. I didn't really know how to respond, but I said, but that's how, that's how we've been taught to see ourselves. And I've had people say things to me like, well, how much can there really be to do in a day? Like how much house cleaning can you really oh do? And I'm like, gosh. people treat motherhood. Like it's a part-time thing you do on the weekend and maybe for an hour or two in the evening. And that's it. And 
that is, and we wonder why we have so many problems in society now. We wonder why people have mental illness and addiction problems and low self-esteem and all of these problems. And it's like, well, maybe if mothers still felt like mothering was a worthy occupation and a worthy thing to spend your time doing, mm -hmm things would be a lot better for everybody. It's so important. I mean, what can you do that's more important than, than that? Or even like, cause I have other people say, well, what if I can't be a mom? Mm -hmm. Well, being a good wife, yeah, being yeah. a good woman in the world is such a huge thing. I mean, if, if you've ever met a woman who's like, I, I would instantly, when I met you thought you're this type of woman, you're just like full of grace. You know what I mean? You have like a graceful, kindness that radiates from you and it's like we need that oh, we need you. that in the world we don't need a bad bitch excuse my language we don't need more bad bitches and more boss bitches we need women of grace we need women who everywhere they go they just make life better for people around them you know what's oh, wrong with that where did we get this idea that if you don't have shoulder pads and you're not a ceo of a corporation or something that you're not worthy or your life didn't turn out well you know and i've i've struggled with that my whole life i think because of the expectations that i was supposed to do something great with my um gifted intellect or whatever they mm -hmm. like to call it you know so then it's like oh you're just a mom oh, you just turned out to be just a mom. And it's so, that's another thing I say. I call myself a stay-at-home mom supremacist. <laughs> oh, I love that. I love that. <laughs> and um, I'm not really a stay-at-home mom. The other moms are stay-at-work moms. Mm -hmm. just, I only say that when people want to, you know, get a little crummy with me and yeah. um, be like derogatory about motherhood. It's like, just flip that around on them and say, no, I'm a stay-at-home mom, but you're a stay-at-work mom you know, and <laughs> that's because clever. sometimes I have to get a little sassy back just to get the point across, yeah. you know what yeah. I'm saying? So if we can convince women that being a, a woman, a godly woman is enough, it is enough. You don't need to make a certain amount of money. You don't have to be Beyonce. You don't have to be Hillary Clinton. You don't have to have a college degree and a job title and a certain amount of money in your bank account to be worthy that's just such a, a destructive idea to, to tell all women that they must be and have and do those things. Yeah. Yeah. Well, your book is going to be amazing. I can't wait to read it. And maybe when, um, maybe in October, I can have you back on the show and we can yeah. continue this conversation. We can just see where this adventure with publishing, you know, self-publishing a book goes. And I want to help promote yeah, it. As I much will as send I you one as soon oh. as I get them, I will send you one so you can review it and um, tell me what parts of it you think were like the most oh, surprising yeah, or interesting. Please. I would love to please autograph it. Absolutely. <laughs> and thank you for the compliment you gave me a moment ago. I feel like since becoming a Christian, what you described has been, you know, present in my life. Whereas before, like I said, it was all about, I don't know, gnosis and like the ayahuasca ceremonies and just thinking I was like this exotic spiritual person. Like, I don't even care about any of that stuff anymore. It's all about what you just said. I want to be a really good wife. Yeah. I want to be a, a kind woman in this world. I want to be giving and in service to whoever I can serve and pray for. And that's yeah. really the focus of my life now. Every yeah, day. And it's so important. And that's what women should be, I think. And I think that's what, that's how we manifest God in our lives and his will for us in our lives. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, if if everybody watching hasn't figured this out, Rachel and I could talk forever. Yeah. <laughs> we could just keep going. Imagine but I, that. <laughs> but I think this is a good place to stop. And I just want to thank you. God bless your family. And I'm so happy that we met. Yeah. Thank you for having me on. I'm so glad that you invited me. All right. And then I think every, this show is going to be really something special and it'll be cool to be like one of the first few guests. I know like, oh, yeah, I was one of the first guests on there. Well, you, know? you were the first, <laughs> you're the first woman for sure. And yeah, one of the first two guests. 
And I, and, and like I said, when I saw you on brother Augustine, I was like, she's perfect. I gotta <laughs> get her on my show. I hope she says yes. <laughs> Absolutely. I'm always happy to come and ramble and yammer <laughs> and talk for hours and hours. So, <laughs> all right. So everybody who's watching, thank you for making it this far. And I have lots of guests lined up. Hopefully next week I can get them on. And if anybody wants to follow me on Instagram, I'll put the link in the description. And um, if you have any questions, you just need support with something you want me to pray for you, just send me a message on Instagram, a devotional heart, and I'll get right back to you. I respond usually immediately or at least within the same day. So Thanks everybody for watching and God bless all of you and your families.